Welcome to Ambition Unleashed Podcast. I'm your host, Marcella Navarrete, and today I am so excited to bring to you one of my good friends and someone I just find to be so incredibly inspirational and an entrepreneur I look up to and wish I could be more like every single day, Mr. Jeff Pieta. Thank you so much for being here, Jeff. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So, Jeff, you have a, a a unique story and it's something I find I find interesting because I feel like every entrepreneur that that I admire and every truly successful person discovered this entrepreneurial spirit at a really young age and so you started at the age of 12 selling greeting cards why like when most kids are playing with toys what made you think of starting your own company selling greeting cards and and door to door like what inspired well, that you know, they, they, they say, uh, you know, necessity is, is often the mother of invention and, you know, money can't buy happiness, but lack of money can't buy anything. And so, you know, when, when you're a kid and you need to, to make money, um, you know, you, you find, you know, any way that you can. And, you know, I, I give my parents credit for you know, being very transparent with my sister and myself with, you know, how much you know, money they had or didn't have or, or like how a mortgage worked. Or, you know, they would, you know, really taught us the value of, of a dollar. And, and that's something that, you know, I recall like, you know, kids my age, like they didn't know how much money their parents made or how much their mortgage was. And so, you know, having parents that were very transparent in, you know, showing the value of, of a dollar. And I remember reading in like on a kids magazine, there was a page, an advertisement for it. It's called Olympia Sales Club where you can get like a sales kit. And you could sell greeting cards and stationery, you know, door, door to door. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And I had a little pitch and, uh, you know, just, just started hustling just any, any way that, that I could to, uh, to make money. My, you know, my parents also instilled values in, you know, don't do anything illegal, immoral or unethical. And so, you know, I remember when, when you know, I was getting into being a teenager, it's some kids were selling drugs and I didn't, you know, want to be involved in any of that. So. Um, you know, I think that, that having, you know, starting and doing it the, the right way and, and following the rules and following the laws, I think that that's really important. That's incredible, Jeff. And now you went to school, you, you went to the University of Illinois and you, you left after your first semester. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not advocating people drop out of school, but, but it is another factor I've seen in, in, in entrepreneurs like yourself where you, you, you're just not, being fed what you need, what you need in school and you, you just go out and you thrive. So you, you left after your first semester to focus on, on starting your first company, AIS. Can you tell us what that was like? And, 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 and what did your family say when you said, I'm dropping out of school? Sure, sure. No, I, I, you know, I, I remember that that was, um, that was in the fall of, of 2001. And, you know, I remember that I was going to have to, you know, pay for, for school on my own. And so I decided to just live at home with my parents and then commute to, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, which was you know, about a half hour each way. And, you know, September 11th happened and then the dot com bubble burst and the economy was in recession. And, you know, I, I wasn't doing very well in school. I, I, I tend to learn, you know, on, on my own, not, not in a classroom. And, and I remember I got in the mail a letter of being on academic probation and the tuition bill, like on the same day. And I'm like, what, what is this? Like, you want the, more money from me and you're threatening to kick me out at the same time. And, and I remember thinking like, okay, my, neither of my parents went to college and you know, I was going to be the first person in my family to go to college. And I remember thinking, well, if I drop out and try to start a company and completely fail, well, school will always be there. I can always go back to school, but you know, I, I, I have nothing to lose. Like when you have nothing to lose, it's easier to take a chance. It's easier to take a risk. That's why, you know, you hear more stories of like rags to riches than middle class to riches, because, you know, once you have like a lot that you can lose and you don't want to to risk it. So when you're young and when you're starting out, that's the the easiest time. And you know, I remember telling my, my dad and he was he was fine. He's like, well, he's like, God, yeah, he didn't see much value in college. My, my my mom was a little disappointed. She wanted me to you know get a degree, but they were you know ultimately supportive. But since I was paying for it on my own, like I, I knew it was my decision. And, you know, it was, it was hard. And I remember thinking that if I could, if I could survive in a down economy, then I can survive and thrive in any economy. And that, that helped me be more prepared for when 2008 hit. And because I already knew what a recession was like. 
And, and so I think about, you know, now where it's been, you know, COVID really doesn't count because that was just a little blip. And I think now it's been so long since 2008, a lot of people, a lot of businesses, they don't know, you know, what it's like to actually go through that. So I think that that was a good experience. Now, what do you, what do you see in the market now? Because there's a lot of talk about, there's been a lot of talk about it's going into recession and it does this year. It seems like things have sort of, uh, inflation is high and, and it seems like business is really slowing down for a lot of people. Are you noticing that as well? You know, um, I do a kickoff meeting at my companies every the beginning of every year for, you know, the last like 10 years. And one of the things I've always said is that there's things that we're counting on that are going to happen. There's things that we're counting on that are not going to happen. And there's things that we're not counting on that are going to happen. And, you know, how, how successful we are or aren't this year depends on how well are we setting ourselves up for success and how well are we responding to, you know, whatever the reality is and, and taking advantage of opportunities. Now, you know, I, I, I think that, that, you know, predicting the stock markets is, it's, it's like predicting the weather. Like you're going to be less wrong about the seasons than you are on whether or not it's going to rain every day. Like I, I, I'll believe that there's been a breakthrough in AI once weather apps suddenly get more accurate, but still like there's, is wrong about whether or not it's going to rain today or rain tomorrow. Like it's like, okay, like I'll, it's, it, you know, they, they can't even predict that. Yeah. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, there, there, there's certain things like with, with the economy and you know, I, I've, I've been reading in the past year about modern monetary theory, which basically states that as long as the government's deficit spending is greater than inflation, then the economy will continue growing because what, what isn't really apparent to most is that the government's fiscal deficit is literally everybody else's fiscal surplus. So okay. people think that the government's deficit is a bad thing, but that means that it's everyone else's surplus. So that's why economies grow when the government deficit spends. Um, you know, when you look over the last you know hundred years, there's usually like a recession in an economic cycle every, you know, seven to 11 years. So, you know, when I started buying a lot of, you know, uh, distressed properties um, around 2011 to 2013, you know, because that's how long it, it usually takes like two years for, you know, the mortgages and the foreclosure process and all that to, to cycle through, you know, by the time 2019 hit, I remember thinking that, okay, it's been 11 years since 2008 and a, a recession happens every seven to you know 10 years. You know, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't think that there's a real estate bubble. Um, but, you know, it's like, Real estate investing is like gambling in extremely slow motion. Like, when do you leave the casino? Well, you leave when you're up. Like, when is a good time to get into real estate? Well, it's obvious when it's a good time. Like 2011, that was obvious it was a good time. You know, when's a good time to sell? Well, when, when you're up. Um, and then when COVID hit and we thought that there was going to be a recession, and I said, oh, I didn't like people. Then people said, oh, like, how did you know that that was going to happen? I said, I didn't know. Like, I just, you know, I didn't want to be greedy. You know, the like, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Like, don't, don't be greedy. Um, and, and, you know, don't be stupid. You know, Warren Buffett made all his money because he's very patient and he buys when there's blood in the streets and then he, he sells when everyone else is greedy. That's what he said. When, when everyone else is fearful, be greedy. When everyone else is greedy, be fearful. Like usually do the opposite of, of most people. Um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting what's going on in China. Like, and that's doesn't seem to get much attention in the media where, you know, China, China's real estate bubble is about 10 times bigger than ours was in 2008. And that's happening right now. Like in the last week, um, one of China's developers uh, that had 500 billion in debt just got liquidated. So wow. China's having their 2008. Now, you know, we look at when the U.S. had 2008 real estate bubble, you know, that did impact the rest of the world. And so, you know, China is about you know two thirds of the size of the U.S. economy. You know, that has to have some impact on the rest of the world as this continues to cycle through. Um, I, you know, when, when you look at 2008, I think a learning lesson that the Fed did was that they didn't stimulate enough. You know, the, the, the 2009 American Re Reinvestment Recovery Act, the, the ARA Obama stimulus was about 780 billion. And that wasn't enough. So that's why 2009 was bad. 2010, it wasn't really until 2013 that the economy started recovering. And so when COVID hit, you know, that's when, you know, the, the Fed said, okay, we're not going to make that same mistake again. And so 
you know, Jerome Powell, they, they increased the money supply by five times. I remember seeing this, this meme that said 80% of all money has been created since COVID. And I, said, and I, I had to fact check that. And so I went to the Federal Reserve website and looked at the M2 money supply. And I said, wow, before COVID, the total money supply was $4 trillion. And then right after 2020, it went up to $20 trillion. So well, they, I had no idea. They, they increased the total amount of cash by five times. And then I remember in 2021, like inflation went down. I said, I said, how does this make sense that we increase money supply by five times and inflation goes down? Like that doesn't make sense. And so whenever things don't make sense, that usually means they only, they only not make sense for so long because ultimately like inflation caught up. And so I think one of the big questions now is, is inflation going to bounce? Because every time in the past when there's been a run up of inflation, when it came down, it bounced instead of just coming down and staying down. And so I, I think the question is, is it like, is history likely to repeat itself or is something unprecedented going to happen? And is there a reason for it? Um, so I, I think that there's, there's that at play. And then I, you know, I think one important thing to keep in mind, especially when investing is one of the famous economists, uh, John Maynard Keynes, he said that markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And like what I take that to mean is don't try to time the market. Like if, if, if your success depends on timing, don't do it. Like if, if, but if you're going to do something where you can be wrong on timing, and still be successful, then then that's okay. Like just d don't try to time the market because um, I read that. Remember reading an SEC report that they said that most retail investors lose money primarily because they get in too late and they get out too early. Like they get in on the bandwagon after a lot of the gains have been made, and then at the first sign of trouble, that's when they get out. So that that's why they, people tend to lose. That makes so much sense. Because people probably aren't aware of those opportunities until everyone's aware of the opportunity. And by then it's, it's just, it's too late. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. But, but I guess to, to, to answer your question, um, I think that, I think that things are going to be fine with the economy. I don't think that we're going to have a recession anytime soon. Um, primarily because the government, you know, continues the deficit spend. When you see the government rein in the deficit spending in the budget, then a recession will likely follow them you know, within 12 months after that. Now, I don't think that interest rates are going to be cut anytime soon. Um, primarily because the Fed was late in raising interest rates. And so inflation got like a little out of hand and the, the, the thing with the, with, with the federal government, and I would say fiscally, like the United States is, is very well run in that, like they learn, they learn their lesson in that you look at like, you know, the Great Depression and the crash of 1929, like 2008 was nowhere near as bad as that. And so, so every type of like economic shock or cycle is less severe than the worst because they're, they're, they're learning their lesson. And, and the only reason why that they would cut rates is if the economy needed stimulus. But as long as we're not in a recession, there's no reason for us to, to cut rates. I, I do think it's interesting though, on how, you know, in, interest rates right now are about the same as when they were in 2005. And that was when I bought my first house. And I remember getting a, like a adjustable rate mortgage that was like interest only. And so the payment was, was affordable. But you don't see that now. And so it's, it's interesting that like, well, if, if housing is unaffordable, why, why aren't they offering, you know, those interest only adjustable rate mortgages with a lower payment? Like they did, you know, 20 years ago when interest rates were this high. So I, I think it's interesting why they're still only pushing, you know, the, the 15 and the, you know, the 30 year mortgages. I, I don't know the answer on why. Yeah. And I keep hearing talk about them reducing. Interest rates, I, I've heard that they're supposed to drop three times this year, and I, I've not seen them drop at all. And in fact, here in LA, housing is so incredibly expensive. The average person can't afford 
to buy. In fact, most people rent because it's cheaper to, it's, it's more economical to rent than it is to, to buy. And it's, it's quite sad, actually. Well, I think that that's also a point that has been, that like doesn't, I don't hear discussed often in that if you look back to, to 60 years ago, the, you know, the American dream was where, you know, someone could have a, a middle class job and buy a home and have, you know, get married and have two kids and be the only person working in the house and live a comfortable life. That was, that was the American dream. And you look at today, that's just no longer possible because the like median wages just haven't kept up with inflation. They haven't kept up with housing prices. They haven't kept up with education. And, and so it, it's, it, it's, it's interesting to see like, well, what, where does, what does that lead to? Um, I, I, I think that, that it's, it is becoming harder. And that's something that, that as a social issue, just, you know, it is, it isn't t- talked about as much. Yeah. And it like is where, something important. Well, where, um, that's where I think is, is, I like, guess somewhat misleading about, so the way that the Fed, you know, they talk about how they're trying to get inflation down to 2%. Like that's what they say. But, and the specific measure is the, they call it the PCE. Now, where I think that that's like a little misleading is that like, let, let's say, for example, that the, the price of, of, of avocados, you know, goes up by, by, by 10%. Well, instead of saying that that inflation of that part was 10%, they're going to say, well, if avocados get too expensive, then people aren't going to buy avocados. They're going to buy apples and apples are cheaper. So inflation really didn't go up that much because it assumes that people will substitute for lower quality goods. And so that's why it's, it's not, it's not, um, as like that, that's why there's a difference between the CPI, which, which compares the same goods versus what the Fed looks at, which is the PCE. And so when they say that, that, they're trying to get that to two percent. That is assuming that people will continually accept a lower, lower standard of life and a lower quality of goods, which um, it's 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 interesting. That is that is, and I I wish that there was, like you said, that there was more talk about that because there really isn't, and it's not it's it's not addressed. I mean, everyone knows that it's an issue, but they touch on it and they say, well, we wish we could do something about that. It's it's a great point, but but nothing's being done to correct it and, and to get more families in homes. So yeah. that's, that's pretty interesting, Jeff. You, you know a lot about, about investing. You know a lot about raising money too. So I want to talk about that as well. You raised mm-hmm. about 60 million in outside capital, uh, for what I understand from only 25 investors for a second company you started called Shift Gig. I, I want I want I want to ask you about why you started Shift Gig and 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 how you saw it as an opportunity in the market. But first, I want to ask you, what was it like raising capital and and how do you do it? What advice do you have for someone that says, "Hey, mm-hmm. Jeff, I have a company and I have this brilliant idea, but I don't have any money. How do I get investors? How do I raise capital?" Sure, sure. I, I think it was it was a lot more than twenty five uh, investors, but I I remember in uh, in, in twenty eleven. That was when, um, you know, one of, uh, what my best friends was Eddie Liu. He was in venture capital for, you know, for 10 years. And, uh, then he wanted to be an entrepreneur again. And, and I would, you know, kid with him that, you know, the, the, the CEOs are like the, the, the professional, you know, athletes. And then the, the investors, the venture capitalists are like the coaches. And so it's, it's like, it's like they're in the same court, but like diff- different roles. And so he wanted to try. You know, you know, being an entrepreneur, and and so you know, we spent you know probably about six months like coming up for an idea because you know one of the key things with with getting any type of investment is that it comes down to credibility on two parts. It's credibility in the idea and credibility in the team. That that's what professional in- investors look for. Um, and, and so, like like for example, like if. If there's an entrepreneur that has a lot of credibility, then the idea doesn't really matter. Like, you know, Elon Musk can come up with an idea to to sell ice cream on Mars and someone will invest in it because he has so much credibility as an entrepreneur. 
Um, but if you're, if you, if you're not Elon Musk, well, then you need to have a very credible idea and, and you need to have, you need to have, you know, some credibility as yourself because you can have the greatest idea, but if, if you don't have, you know, if you're not convincing enough, um, where people don't believe you're going to be able to execute on that because ideas are easy. Execution is hard. You know, whenever I talk to an aspiring entrepreneur and they say, Oh, you know, I have, I have this idea, but I don't want to tell you because you might steal it. I say, I say, well, then don't bother because anybody who is able to execute, there's no shortage of ideas. Like I've always have more ideas than I have time to execute. So, you know, don't, don't, the ideas are, are, are the easy part. Um, so. So I, I would say like, like taking a step back, first of all, is like realize, like, do you truly need to raise money? Um, I'm a big fan of, of bootstrapping, of you know, you know, working hard and like growing a company like with your own cash flow. It's like running down the street, like you're limited by your own air. If, if you trip and fall, you can get back up when you're venture backed. It's like skiing downhill. You're going a lot faster. And if you fall, you know, you may be on the news. Like, look at, like, that's where you, you hear with like big startups blow up, like they're, they're in the news. But yeah. whereas like when small businesses blow up, well, there's, you know, a million of them in the country. So you don't hear about them. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's understanding credibility and idea, credibility in yourself is making sure that you have, you know, the right idea. And like, is it, there's there truly a business case for it? Like, is it, is it a painkiller and not a vitamin? Like, is it solving the problem? Um, like I would often ask, like, like, how would the world be worse off if this idea didn't exist? And if someone, you know, struggles to answer that, then that's okay. Well, then it's probably, you know, a, a vitamin. Um, it, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, be critical with, with your own ideas. And I think that that's something that, that's, that's important. Um, but, you know, it's also important to have the right mentors and to have people with the right um, relationships. Like I was fortunate with, uh, you know, having a partner where you know, he was in venture capital for, for 10 years. And so, you know, being partnered with him to raise money, it's like, it's like a, a, a prosecutor becoming a defense attorney. You know, it's the same table. They're just on a different side. So some, some oftentimes the best defense attorneys are former prosecutors. Um, that that's what kind of opened my eyes a lot where it, it's it's less about especially like if you're raising money early where you don't have anything to show it's more of an idea so you know what someone's opinion is matters a lot more than what because there's no actual numbers to show um but but as an entrepreneur it's also hard when you realize that like you're spending a lot of time like and raising money takes a lot of time because it it is a sales process and that when you think about, you know, when you're going about selling anything, well, you first have to identify like, you know, who's your target market and what, you know, how are you selling to them? What, what, you know, you're putting your, your pitch deck together, you know, features, questions, you know, objections. And then, then you're, you know, marketing to them. You're, you're contacting them, going back and forth, getting meetings and you're having the meetings and you're doing follow up and to where, you know, I think in the early in the early days, you know, Eddie was spending most of his time on that. And I was spending probably half of my time, and and the time that you spend raising money, at the end of the day, is just to dilute yourself, because it's you're not you're not you're not spending time selling customers, and it's not helping you build your product. Like it's helping you dilute yourself. So so realizing that that as well, and that's why one of the reasons why I think you know only raise money like if if you have to. And if you're, if it's something that doesn't make sense to bootstrap, because with, with shift gig, we knew that it was going to take millions to, you know, build out the, the, the initial platform and bootstrap the, the marketplace. It just wasn't feasible to do, um, you know, I, I, on your own, um, you know, just with our, with our own cash. And so I, I would say that, that you know, having the right mentors, having the right uh, partner to understand you know, the, just the, the process of, of how that goes and like the differences between, you know, the different types of investors, like what you're going to say to, you know, a venture capital investor versus a, a family office and, and, you know, the types of things that are important to them. Like, like if you're based in the Midwest, you know, knowing that, you know, a, a West Coast, you know, venture capitalist may, you know, may prefer someone that, that is, you know, in Silicon Valley. 
Um, but then also, you know, looking at the macroeconomic climate, like when we were raising money at Chip Gig, most of it was between like you know 2012 to 2014. Um, interest rates were really low. When when interest rates are low, you know, people that have a lot of cash, like there's not many good alternatives for them. So that's why you see you know tech companies and a lot of venture investing when interest rates are low. Um, because the, the risk free alternative is, is, is not that interesting. But now that interest rates are higher and you know, someone with, with, you know, any kind of money can get, you know, five and a half percent just from treasuries that, that sets a higher bar for expectations of, of, of an investment. And so that's why whenever interest rates are higher, there's a lot less venture investing and there's a lot less mergers and, and acquisitions. Um, it doesn't mean that there's none, but I think like what, what I would take that to be is you know, now is not the best time to try to be raising for money. And that if you're able to bootstrap and to, to, to take the time and to, you know, find a way to test your, your idea without having to, to raise money. Um, I think that now is a good time to do that because you can, you can always you know, raise money when interest rates are lower. Oh, that's such great advice. I, I never knew that, that, um, raising more capital had anything to do with, with when interest rates were low or high. I, I never, I never associated the two. So that's, that's really great advice for someone who is, is considering looking for capital. Now I'm, I'm familiar with Shift Gig. I love Shift Gig. I think it's a, a phenomenal company, a great idea. And, and for those that don't know, Shift Gig is, is a, a platform that allows people to go and pick a job for a, a day or for a specific industry for a day. And, and you can always, it's, it's like, it's like, I, I don't know what temp work is like, but I assume it's like temp work, but, but better. Um, because you can, you can switch every day. You can switch, do one thing in, during the morning and another thing in the evening. And you have just easy access to choose. What made you, what made you think of shift gig? So the interesting thing is like you look at when when new things exist, then you look at okay, what solutions are now possible because this exists that previously weren't possible. So like for example, the iPhone you know, first came out in two thousand seven, Android in two thousand eight, and Uber was founded in two thousand nine. Now, you know. Travis Kalanick, who founded Uber, had nothing to do with the creation of iPhone and Android, but that's also not a coincidence because if you think back to before iPhone and Android, where there was like a dozen different, you know, smartphones that were, you know, minimally capable and Blackberries and Palm and Sidekicks and Nextels. And so back then, like there was like a dozen different platforms and data, cellular data was extremely slow. It wasn't technically feasible to create like an Uber like app on a BlackBerry. And so when, and the interesting thing is like by 2009, you went from 12 cellular platforms down to two. Like even by 2009, like 70% of smartphone market share was iPhone or Android. Like it really consolidated very quickly because every, everyone wanted an iPhone. I, I had one back then. And, and so, so I have to imagine that, that, you know, the, the founder of Uber said, okay, everyone has these smartphones that you can run like a sophisticated app, cellular data is faster, and there's only two of them. So, what can we build now that is now possible that previously wasn't possible? And, you know, you think back where, you know, before you had to call a cab and now, okay, you can use an app for that instead of having to call a cab. And, and, and so, you know, that's when, you know, Uber came out. And I remember in 2011 when it was when Uber came to Chicago and, you know, that's when Eddie and I were trying to brainstorm and come up with, you know, an idea for a company. We, we just wanted to find a, a, you know, scalable idea. And I remember, um, you know, looking into, well, like, why does Uber make sense? And Uber makes sense for both sides because as, as a, a customer, just using the app, well, it's more convenient than calling a cab company. Cause if you call a cab company and they said they're sending a cab, like you have no idea what, what their status is until they just magically appear. Whereas on an app, okay, you can show real time status. And so there's a lot of things you can do with an app. And then for the driver, the thing that really, uh, interested me is that whenever I would take Uber, I remember in 2011, I would ask every single Uber driver, I said, okay, before Uber existed, 
like, were you a cab driver? And almost all of them said no. And I said, okay, well, why is it that you're now doing the job of a cab driver, but before Uber, you were not interested in being a cab driver? And it was, you know, because of the, the, the convenience and the flexibility that Uber offered, where if you wanted to be a cab driver traditionally, like you had to make a commitment. That was, that was your job. You couldn't just casually do that. And says, so okay, well, this is interesting. So Uber expanded both sides of, they expanded to customers that otherwise wouldn't use it. They, and they also expanded the labor pool to people that otherwise would not be interested in, in being a cab driver, but they were essentially being cab drivers. And, and so I thought that that was fascinating. So, well, where, what are other areas that, you know, this concept can apply to because of, you know, if you're able to use technology and mobile apps to offer greater choice, convenience, and flexibility, then where can you expand the labor supply or be able to solve some problems in ways that they previously haven't been able to be solved before? And, and I remember looking into all of um, temp staffing because I said, well, what if it's like Uber, but without the car? Like if you want to work when you want, where you want, as little or as much as you want, driving a car, there's Uber. But what if you want to do that without driving a car? Like, what does that look like? And um, so that's that's temp staffing. And I remember at the time the, the entire U.S. temp staffing market was about um, around 100 billion. And the largest segment of that was uh, it's called considered light industrial temp staffing, which is about 35 billion. And um, you know, basically like, like hourly work, you know, under, you know, under 15, $20 an hour typically is, is what is considered light industrial. Um, you know, other segments are like 10 billion is, is IT. I think another 8 billion is, is healthcare. And I think another like 20 billion is administrative, um, uh, clerical. And, and so the, the, the reason why, like I, I look focus on light industrial because I thought that something that was also interesting about Uber is that it's not that the drivers were unskilled because when I would talk to the drivers, like I would more, I would, it would be, you know, a, a college kid that just graduated college with a master's degree or, you know, uh, or like someone that was like an engineer and, and they're just, you know, they're bored at, at, at home. And, and so like more often than not, the Uber drivers are skilled. It's that they're non-specifically skilled. Like, the, the only, the, the least common denominator that they had to have was being able to drive a car. And, and so when we looked at with temp staffing, like light industrial is non-specifically skilled where those are the, the types of, of, of jobs where you're doing like picker, picking and packing in, you know, a, a warehouse or a retail store, um, or the, you know, food and beverage, um, for, you know, for stadiums, uh, for, for hotels and, um, where it's, it's not specifically skilled and that there was an opportunity to, to not only expand the supply of labor that's available, but then also to provide customers with, with visibility into, um, in ways that they previously didn't have. I, I remember with, um, you know, an early conversation with, you know, one of the world's largest retailers that they had, you know, 4,000 store managers that were spending a billion dollars a year on, on temp staffing for their stores. And they did it by having their, their 4,000 store managers calling local temp agencies. And I remember saying, well, okay, if there's an app for that, would you use it? And they said, yes, but not for the reason why you expect it. I said, well, what's that? I said, well, the problem with having you know, thousands of store managers you know, calling and placing orders is that they don't know if they're over budget until the home office and, you know, wherever they're, um, gets the invoices and then they realize that they've spent too much. I said, well, they're saying, well, if there's an Apple, then you should be able to have visibility. I said, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, it, it led to, to some, some interesting ways. And so I would say that that is, you know, a, a key point is to, to pay attention to trends and to, to try to understand like, okay, like, why does this exist now that it previously didn't exist? And, and so that's where, you know, connecting the dots with, Okay, Uber exists because iPhone and Android are now a thing, and this is why they're different than than they were in the past. And I would say, like, like a, a current trend is also what, which essentially what is Uber has enabled is you know take any service that people or businesses use, 
and find a way to give it to them in smaller pieces. And so, you know, Uber is more convenient than renting a car if you do it occasionally. Like everyone knows that if you use Uber all the time, like to get to work every day, well, it's going to be more expensive than buying a car. And it, you know, it's the essentially like the cloud is the same thing. It's, it's, you know, renting servers in smaller pieces. But if you need a lot of it, it's, it's, you know, cheaper to, you know, to, to buy your own. But I think that there's, there's still more opportunities, um, with that. But then also, you know, anytime that there's something new that really catches, you know, fire, like to realize that there's a tendency to think that any new thing is the greatest thing since sliced bread and can be applied in so many different areas. Like I remember during the dot com bubble, you know, there was like a ice cream delivery company going public. Like, like it was just ridiculous things. And, and eventually when people settle down, they realize, okay, there's this new concept. It's good for a few things. It's not good for everything. And I think especially the past year with AI, like you see you're like AI for everything, where I think that that's going to end up is that, okay, this AI stuff is good for a few things, but it's not good for everything. And so people have a tendency to try to like apply it to everything, but it's going to be good for a few things. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, and, and everyone's just raving about AI and trying to find new things that they can use it for instead of just using old stuff, perhaps that may be better. Mm -hmm. So I completely yep. agree with you. Jeff, I have such a special place in my heart for Shift Gig. I, 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 I just think it's an incredible company, but also I'm so thankful to you. So I want to thank you for allowing, um, allowing me to use it at a time where I really needed it. And, and you know about my health and I, I was, I was really struggling having seizures every hour. I, I couldn't stay awake for more than just a, a couple hours at a time. And I couldn't hold a job because who wanted someone that could only work for a couple hours. And in that time frame, you were going to have a seizure every hour. And so I would, I would look for work and I would go into bathrooms and hide in a bathroom uh, to have my seizure where no one would see and, and, and try to walk back out like nothing. And I remember uh, one day go, going to you and I was just, I was just really upset. I was crying because I, I couldn't, I couldn't work anywhere. And you just, you were so kind and you let me know that, that I always had a home at shift gig and I always had work that no matter what happened, you would, you would just never let me go without having work. And so, uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm healthy and I'm healed and I'm so much better, but I, I've never forgotten your kind words and, and I'm just so thankful to you and I'm so thankful to shift gig. And I just, I just want to take the time to publicly thank you for, for being so kind. And, and I assume that you run every company that you own like that and that you treat every employee and every, every person you work with, with that same, just grace and kindness. I, I remember when I was first starting out, I, I couldn't afford to you know, pay people because I didn't have any money. I couldn't afford to pay them what, you know, what they otherwise can get. And, and so I treated them as if they were you know, doing me a favor because they were. And that mindset, you know, stuck, stuck with me. I, I'm a big believer in, in, in servant leadership and I believe in, you know, always do right by people because you never know, you know, when and where and how you'll see them again. Yeah. That, that's such a great way to live. And it, 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 it touches people's life and they remember it always. And they, they, they take that with them and, and hopefully treat others the same way because they remember how, how amazing it made them feel. So I, I think that's a great way. It's a great way to live. You know, what do you think some of the, some of the biggest lessons you've learned? You've been an entrepreneur since you were 12. So that's a long time and a lot of learning. And I'm sure a lot of, a lot of ups and downs and challenges. What are some of the, the most important things you've learned as an entrepreneur? I, I would say that, um, you know, have, be deliberate about finding good mentors because, you know, everyone, everyone says, Oh, if I can go back in time 20 years and tell myself something, this is what I would say. Well, finding good mentors, that's, they're essentially doing that. Like you're a younger version of, of them. And to, I would say to, to realize that the value is in other people and that like, 
it's easy to say that you want to find people smarter than you to work for you. But then whenever I hear that, I say, okay, well, why would someone smarter than you want to work for you? Like to really like to really truly think about that. Um, and to be a, a, a lifelong learner and a student of history and to, to be brutally honest with yourself and with your ideas. I've, I've met many failed entrepreneurs where, you know, they would say, Oh, you know, the market wasn't ready for it or, or it was just a bad idea. And, you know, it's be, be okay with, you know, being critical on, on your idea or, or on pivoting, like to, you know, fail small so that you don't fail big. You know, I, I look at failure as failure is just a measure that whatever you are willing or able to do to succeed wasn't good enough. That's, that's what failure is. And, and if you fail small and admit that you're wrong, then, then you don't fail big. I think that, you know, some people have a tendency to become their own Ponzi scheme where it's like they keep like, building up the lie bigger and bigger and bigger until like they just get consumed by just maintaining the lie when they just, you know, just, just own it. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, grew up lower middle class and went to a high school that was, you know, wealthier and, and, you know, was one of the poor kids. And, you know, I had a you know junk car and I remember when I was in high school, got a license plate that said broke because I'm okay. Like own it. I'm, I'm just going to own it. And I, I keep it. I kept that plate and now it just reminds me where, where I came from. And, and I, and I think that like, if, if you have a perceived weakness and if you own it, you can make it a strength. And, and like, like we're all dealt a head, a hand of cards when we're born, like play it the best that you can. Like, sure. Some people are smarter. Some people are taller. You know, some people are born wealthier. Like don't spend any time thinking about, you know, what someone else has or what you don't have. Like spend all your time thinking about, like, here's what I have. Here's what I can do. And, and here's what I'm going to do. Like, don't, don't spend any time, like, like stuck in your head. Don't, don't overthink things. Just keep making progress. That's really great advice. And I, I, I bet that probably one of the most difficult things for most entrepreneurs is to be able to admit failure, admit when they're wrong. I think it's easier just believing the lies and not wanting to be critical of yourself. Uh, because it, it hurts less, you know, ex especially if you, you spend so much time and money and effort into creating something that just doesn't work. It's, it's, it's easier to make an excuse than, than admit it was just a bad idea. Yeah. Or, or, you know, when you learn the same lesson more than once, like you got to be hard on yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I, I've had costly mistakes. I, I've, I've been wrong, um, a lot about things and, you know, don't like the right answer to most questions throughout the universe is balance. So what that means, like in this context is, you know, if you're wrong about something, like don't dwell on it, but also don't ignore it because neither extreme is good. I've seen people where, where they just keep screwing up and they just ignore it and think that everything's fine. And then I see people, they screw up and they like beat themselves up so much that they just get paralyzed. Like, the right answer to most things is balance. Rarely is extremity justified. That's so true. Jeff, you have given us such incredible advice. I, I you're, you're amazing. I, I look up to you. I admire you so much. I'm so happy just to, just to know you and be able to reach out to you and, and ask you, you know, questions. And, and, and I, I look to you as, as someone I admire. And so thank you for teaching me. Absolutely. Thank you for, Anytime. for being a, a mentor from afar. I, I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. And I, I hope we get to interview you again. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Jeff. Have, have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye.